The Rainbow Tower, written by Alex Timms, illustrated by R.H. Stewart. Episode 24, Orange. Jed was marched through the people thronging the transfer lobby. Yellow guards ran ahead, pushing the crowds out the way as the orange executive strode forwards. Jed, the bulky enforcers either side of him, followed, the queues reforming behind him as he passed. The lift doors slid open as they approached and the executive signed three different sets of documents at the desk in front, pocketing the top copy of each. They then entered the car. Jed looked nervously at it all. The last time he'd been in this type of lift, Silas and he had been forced to climb for their lives. As he walked past the lift attendant, he wondered where Silas was now and how near was the mass. The car was designed to take over 30 people, but only the four of them entered. Jed caught a last glimpse of the crowds in yellow just before the doors met to find everyone, including the moustache guard, staring at him. All of them looked glad it wasn't them being escorted upwards. Jed couldn't help wondering if he was in as much danger now as he had been dangling over the mass. The executive took Jed's phone out of his pocket and flipped it over and over in his hands. Jed knew they were moving, but he couldn't feel it. He also knew the concrete between the colours was at the most four metres thick, but it still took forever for the lift to travel that short distance. A soft ping told them they'd arrived in orange. Jed had expected more crowds as the doors opened, but instead they revealed an empty foyer. All he could see, just outside the doors, was a single white enforcer standing beside a desk. He walked out to another surprise. This lobby was over four times the size of the one in yellow. His boots sank into thick orange carpet, while way above him, suspended from the ceiling, was a huge and very ornate chandelier. It sparkled and twinkled with every other crystal in its many tiers winking orange. There was polished chrome and shiny black wood everywhere, from the enforcer's desk to the doors leading off the lobby. The walls were covered in giant mirrors in strange geometric shapes. As the lift doors closed behind, Jed saw the executive checking his hair in one, flicking his fringe to make it lie properly. Jed hated the lobby. It made him feel small and self-conscious, which he guessed was the effect they wanted. OK, the executive said in a bored voice. Terminate his contract. The enforcers grabbed Jed. Hey, Jed protested. What are you doing? The executive pulled the sheets of paper from inside his jacket. He counted them off. P45, P11D and P60. What did you say your name was? You said you'd take me to the chief executive. Well, he doesn't have time to listen to little people like you, the executive replied as he looked at the forms. You're a nobody, and nobodies never have anything interesting to say. I'll fill in his name later. The rest is in order. He put the sheets away and held out the phone. Just need you to sign this one to say this was in your possession. It was another form stuck to the phone casing. What about the person from red? That must be important for you to come all the way from orange to yellow, Jed argued. The executive looked at Jed. Well, you've already helped me with that one. When you don't return, the others will be desperate to tell me all they know so the same thing doesn't happen to them. They just need a bit more time to realise it. He stripped off the form and began turning the phone over and over in his hand again. Oh, I'll sort this later as well. It'll only be an X or something like that. Uh, do it. The enforcer at the desk stepped forward as one holding Jed's left arm also grabbed his hair and pulled his head back. Jed heard a metallic whine as the approaching enforcer primed his baton. It crackled and sparked as he approached, joining the light show from the chandelier. Jed could see no eyes through the blank brass-rimmed portals in the hood as the enforcer brought the prod up to his face, just the dim reflection of the sparks flicking from the metal tube. If the eyes were the windows to the soul, then this figure in front of him didn't have one. 
Jed tried to struggle, but the enforcers had him clamped tight. He felt the pain of their grip on his arms, but was too focused on the baton to worry about it. A spark arced across, sending a tingle down his body. He smelt the acrid stench of burnt hair and realised it was his own. Closer and closer to his face, the baton came. Another spark, this time hitting his cheek and sending pain searing across his face. They were going to do it. It didn't matter what fancy name they gave it, they were going to kill him. What if, what if I did have something interesting to say? Jed said as the baton whined. Then would you take me to the chief executive? Oh, please, the aide replied. The baton whine increased in pitch. It was only a matter of moments before it discharged again right into Jed's perspiring face. What if I said that phone in your hands belonged to my mother? What if I said she was the last chief executive? The man stopped turning the phone over and glanced down at its back. Still the prod whined, and still the enforcer brought it closer and closer. Jed was almost cross-eyed trying to look at the baton. He steeled himself. It was going to discharge any second, and there was nothing he could do about it. Bag him! Jed came to in stifling darkness. It was hard to breathe, and it didn't take long to work out that the rank smell was coming from himself. From the way the world moved around him, he could tell he was in a lift. Not the slow transfer one between colours, but an express one that ran within a single colour band. He was speeding upwards, but how he came to be there he didn't know. The last thing he remembered was facing the electric prod in the orange foyer. He felt the lift slow to a crawl, then shuffle and bump its way over an obstruction, only to accelerate upwards again. Jed tried to move, but his hands were tied firmly behind his back and his feet had been pulled up behind him and attached to his hands. All he could do was lie where he was. Again the lift slowed, this time accompanied by a soft chime. Wherever they were taking him, it was clear they had arrived. Still in clawing darkness, Jed felt hands untie his feet before he was dragged unsteadily upright. His own hands remained secured behind his back and whatever was over his head was tied somewhere around his waist. Jed stumbled forward as the same vice-like grip propelled him onwards. He wished they'd hold him somewhere different for his arms were bruised in that place and the pain was excruciating. He was forced to stop, waiting in hushed silence. Jed felt more carpet under his feet and he sank even further into this one than he had in orange. Where was he? At least the pause had helped him become steadier on his feet. Jed winced, as yet again they grabbed him in exactly the same place. Even their fingers hit the same spots, and he was marched forward again. With no warning, the bag was torn off him and Jed squinted at the suddenly bright lights. Uh, M M Mr Swenson, it was the orange executive's voice, uh, this is him. Those fools in Violet didn't terminate his contract as we assumed. This is Julia's son. Jed tried to open his eyes enough to see properly, but they were taking what felt like forever to adjust. All he could make out in front of him was a huge dark expanse, possibly a table with a person seated at the far end. Swenson, Jed said, peering at the seated individual. I thought I was being taken to see the chief executive. My dear boy, said a mild voice from the figure at the far side of the room. I am the chief executive. Thank you very much for listening to The Rainbow Tower. To see more of R. H. Stewart's excellent artwork, you'll find him on Instagram at roy.hootson.stewart. For Alex Timms, why not try the novel Outcast at AO3.com? Or, for something completely different, check out the Amier series on YouTube or at Amier.com. Also by Alex Timms. The Rainbow Tower. Text copyright Alex Timms. Illustrations copyright R.H. Stewart. 
the right of Alex Timms and R.H. Stewart to be identified as the author and illustrator of this work has been asserted in accordance with the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, 1988.